going to space is going to combat with the, the enemy being the environment and mechanical things. So it was a very, very similar feeling to me as that razor sharp feeling that you have as a well-trained, ready to go, well-briefed, well-informed, well-supported operator stepping out to do your mission, whether it's an aviator rolling over to drop the bombs or, or a helicopter pilot making that perfect landing in a combat zone or the ground guys stepping off the helicopter, going left, going right uh, onto a hot zone. It was that same exact feeling like, bring it on. That's, how, that's what I remember thinking, like, bring it. What do you got, space? Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we have a combat story first with our first astronaut who spent over 377 days in space and completed 10 spacewalks where he's actually out in space in nothing but his suit, Chris Cassidy. Before he joined NASA, Chris was a Navy SEAL and one of the very first sent into Afghanistan in 2001 after 9-11. There's very little Chris has not accomplished. He attended the US Naval Academy, received a Master of Science in Ocean Engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, and has two honorary PhDs. As a SEAL, Chris earned a Bronze Star with Valor and a Presidential Unit Citation for Combat in Afghanistan. He was NASA's 14th Chief Astronaut, which is the head of NASA's Astronaut Corps and is the Principal Advisor to the NASA Administrator on Astronaut Training and Operations. Chris is incredibly humble given his accomplishments, and it's no surprise he is now president and CEO of the National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation, where he's leading efforts to build out an iconic museum for Medal of Honor recipients, a leadership institute, and a monument on the National Mall. I hope you enjoy this view from space from such a down-to-earth man as much as I did. Special thanks to our previous guests, Daryl Utt and Mike Hayes, who helped us connect with Chris. Chris, thanks very much for taking the time to share your story with us today. My pleasure. And just before we jump in, um, we haven't really seen a backdrop like the one that you have. And I know that we're going to talk a lot about the, the National uh, Medal of Honor Museum Foundation, but could you just tell us briefly where you're calling in from so people have an idea? Yeah, I'm calling in from uh, our, the preview center to the National Medal of Honor Museum here in Arlington, Texas. We've got a small space where we've got a few items that will migrate themselves to our museum upon completion of the construction. And behind me it is uh, a, a flag of a Medal of Honor action in, in World War II. So uh, a cool place, I thought, to have this conversation. Yeah, it's amazing. For those who are listening and, and aren't watching the, uh, the video, it's a, a huge flag in the background, um, tattered on the sides, uh, really, really impressive. So if you have a chance to see the video, take a look. Chris, just before we jump in, as I mentioned, um, we've interviewed two people that you know well, Daryl Utt and uh, Mike Hayes. And in chatting with Mike before this to get prepped, he wanted me to ask um, how you felt about me having already interviewed the better half of swim team number one. <laughs> I knew that was coming. How did I know what the question was before you even asked it? But yeah. In, Mike and I go back to our very first days in the Navy where we showed up at SEAL training together and we were, uh, we were paired off as, uh, as what was called swim pair one, just really a list of, of how your time, swim times break out and, and putting uh, similar swimmers together. And uh, we made it through training the whole time as, as swim pair one and we're very pr proud of that. And, and there never... A month goes by without a jab one way or the other about who was the faster, the better, uh, and the, the, the swim, swim, buds, buds, class, buds student. And it just, he explained this to me, but I never heard this. Could you just briefly explain what a swim pair is, how you figure that out and when it happens in buds? He probably has a better memory of exactly, but my recollection is we, we all, the whole class swims a two mile swim or a mile swim or something and or early in the process and and then your times are just written down and they pair people together who have similar swim abilities 
And your job is to be within six feet of that person at all times. And in some cases, tethered by a six foot line. Uh, but your job is to stay within six feet of, of that person the whole, the whole entire time. And if you're ever caught not with your swim buddy, you know, you pay, you pay dearly. So it's a concept that gets ingrained in your head, um, which I actually have an interesting story about that later in my career as an NASA astronaut that I'd love to share with you. Yeah, please. If I don't, it, does it have to do with being tethered to some other person? Or not. Yeah. Or not. Okay, great. Don't let me lose sight of that one. Um, and I guess the other part with, uh, with Mike, there was something I remember reading in his book, Never Enough, which is a great book. And I believe you took a picture of it from space, which, is, which is pretty cool um, in its own right. But he describes this scene where you guys are at Bud's. And again, we should say swim pair or swim team one means you two are the fastest in the class, right? So I know um, you're a very humble guy. Just thought we'd call that out. Um, but in the book, he talks about this kind of smoke session your class was a part of. You guys are just out out in the surf getting getting wrecked. And people are just, morale was low. And I think he describes you as just laughing uncontrollably. And it kind of... Um, caught on with other folks and the whole group ended up laughing together and, and just getting them through a tough time. Do you remember that? I do remember that. I also, you know, I, I do, I do a fair amount of public speaking now. And, and one of the things I like to share that the, the key thing I learned in, in, in SEAL training, particularly in Hell Week, is that you can't get through it alone. Uh, and in that case, I was somebody that helped out others that were miserable, but I, I remember very distinctly uh, one time for me, I was, I was feeling really sorry for myself and cold and miserable. I looked over at one of uh, an exchange officer from Thailand who had no fat on his body at all, like 0% body fat. And he was just jackhammering away so cold. And I thought to myself, wow, if he's grinding through this. He's way colder than I am, you know, and, yeah. and he gave me a spark and he didn't even know it. Another time, a buddy of mine, Don, Don Spites, we were sitting eating a cold MRE together and I just was blazed, glaring off into nowhere. And he knew me well enough to know that I was kind of zoning out. And he just, all he did was nudge me with an elbow and said, Hey, come back. And, uh, and that's all it took. And, and so the, the key takeaway is any person has a bad day or a bad moment or a bad set of pushups or, you know, you've done it yourself and whatever you, in all of your uh, activities. And, and it just takes somebody else to find the humor in it or yeah. whatever that moment requires or asks for. It just, it, yeah. I, I do remember laughing, just thinking, boy, this couldn't get any suckier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's so, it's so well described in the book. Um, so I, I'm sure, as we'll talk about here, you, you're in the teams, an astronaut, you're running a huge uh, foundation build out that's multi-year uh, program coming up. I don't think anybody has, uh, has had to concern themselves with calling you an overachiever to some degree. But if we look back to Chris as a kid, would we see the same kind of person, like involved in a lot of things, high achiever, or did that come later? You know, it's interesting. I, I didn't think of myself as that growing up. You know, I, I, got, I got good grades, but not the best grades. I was a good athlete, but not the best athlete. You know, I was a, I was a solid basketball player, a decent football player. Baseball was just a thing I did. Uh, it wasn't a passion of mine, but occasionally I got on base and uh, occasionally I made an error. I played first base football. I played quarterback basketball, uh, you know, just was on the court. But uh, I, I do remember always wanting to be busy I, I loved, I loved um, working. I mowed lawns as a kid. Uh, initially, my first couple jobs were very labor kind of, I was a dishwasher in a restaurant. I always, there was a, a farmer who grew corn not far from my house. Uh, so when I was like uh, young, maybe 14, I forget exactly how old, but uh, that was my first job picking corn and that was hard. And then uh, and then the a bus boy dishwasher at a restaurant. And that was really tough work. Uh, and then I realized, Hey, I could do this. I could do something on my own that might 
be hard work, but at least I'm outside and, and getting, getting some exercise. And that's, that's where I, I mowed lawns for the rest of my summers and just really loved it. My brother and I worked together at it for uh, part of that, part of that time. And that was fun as well. So I wouldn't say I was an overachiever. I was just a kid that, that tried to have a little spending money, tried to do well at whatever I was doing. I took pride in mowing lawns. Well, I took pride in, in, uh, on, oh, being a good teammate on whatever team I was on. So, yeah, I, I was, I was a, a, a decent kid at a lot of stuff. I, yeah. I don't think I excelled at, at any one thing. Yeah. And I think overachiever is the wrong sentiment. It's more high achiever is what I was looking for, but I, I see exactly what you mean here. Um, it, the theme of it uh, started then. And, and, and uh, now that I'm older and I can reflect on stuff, it's really this sense of not wanting to disappoint others in my life, like people that I love, my family, my friends, my colleagues at work, my teammates uh, in my professional life, my crewmates at NASA, always wanting to have do my part to make things successful or to not be the one responsible for it not going well. Uh, and I think that, it, that probably did start when I was a, a young guy. Where did that come from? Was it something from your parents? You know, my, I had I had great parents um, who loved my brother and I and gave us a fantastic upbringing. Um, I don't think they did anything different than, than other great parents do. Uh, so part of that must have been just been born in me. Uh, I don't really know, to be honest with you. Yeah, no. Uh, were, were your parents former military, Chris? Or Nobody not? in the military. Well, my dad, my dad... Um, was drafted in, in the Vietnam era. And he did a couple of years as a Marine Corps mechanic and then got out and uh, uh, just, you know, did his brief time. But, yeah. but essentially no military background in my family. Wow. So where did it come from for you? And how early did it come? So uh, we always liked watching sports in my house. And, and, uh, and I remember from a young age watching the army Navy football game with my brother and dad. And, uh, I always thought it was super cool when it, when the midshipmen from Navy and the cadets from West point would march onto the field. And there was all this excitement about the game and it just seemed like a big deal. And the president of the United States would go. That's true. Yeah. Um, and then they, in the in the commercial times, they would show little snippets of what the schools looked like. And I had never been to either one. And so I thought, wow, that's really, really neat. And that was just as I was a young guy. And then in, in high school, when it came time serious to think about college, I knew I wanted to go to college, but paying for it was a factor. And um, and then I stumbled across in a, in a book in the guidance counselor's office about the Naval Academy, I think a glass a glossy brochure with fancy pictures and, and things. And, and I, and I was like, Oh, that's what I've always watched at, at you know, at the end of football season. And, uh, uh, so I started to pursue the requirements to, to get in there. The, since we have some time, I'll share with you an, yeah. an interesting story that, uh, part of that process that really was fundamental to me, uh, in my, in my development as a person really, uh, so when I learned about the Academy, I, I read that you had to apply to your Congressman's office. So I did that and I, I sent the application. I was granted an interview. I went for the interview and the interview, uh, in the staffer at the Congressman's office says, okay, good job. You did great. Uh, we'll take it from here and we'll get back to you. And I what, thought, what oh, state is it, Chris? Just Maine. Uh, Maine. It, okay. Yeah. So that's I where you grew up. Grew up in a, a southern Maine, York, Maine, the, the southern corner of, of, uh, of Maine. And I went to Augusta, which was our state capital, and, and did this interview. And she said, okay, we'll take care of it. And uh, I, I'm like, okay, I'm done. Like, yeah, you're, you're good. So that was the fall of my senior year in high school. We fast forward to spring of my senior year in high school when everybody's getting information if you got in or not a thick envelope or a thin envelope or whatever and and i got nothing from the naval academy so i i picked up the phone and called the admissions office and, and the woman asked so what's your name again can you spell it and i hear her going through files what's your social security number going through files 
I'm sorry, we, we have nothing in our system about you. You you effectively have not applied to the Naval Academy. Like, uh, oh my uh-huh. God, are you kidding me? Uh, so it just so happened that my friend, his dad was taking a business trip from Maine to Washington, D.C., which is like an eight hour drive. And my friend and I were, were planning to join him to just do sightseeing stuff on our spring break. And uh, so that was the next week. And I, I did that as planned. And, and un, I took a, a, now one of those days, I took an afternoon and drove over from D.C. to Annapolis, which is half hour or so, and went to the admissions office and walked in. And the lady said, oh, you're the young person from Maine. You need to see Captain Melillo. You know, he's down the hall, third door on the right. Can't miss him. So I walked down the hall, go in. And there's Captain Melillo like the stereotypical Marine Corps specimen. Perfect, <laughs> you know, clean cut, uh, high and tight, square jaw, perfect rigid posture, uniform squared away, shoes that you can see your reflection in. And uh, my eyes get big and I'm like, oh my gosh, who is this person? And uh, so I tell him my story and I could tell he's looking at me like, dude, everybody else got their application in. How come you couldn't? Yeah. And so I was thinking, even I was, I was telling him like, well, this is, I'm trying, but I, I don't think this is going to work out. And he said, okay, I understand. I'll get back to you. And I thought that, okay, that was the end of it. The next week I'm back in school and I get paged to come to the office for a phone call. And when they hand me the phone, it's him on the line. He said, Hey, Cassidy, I got good news. I can get you into the Naval Academy prep school, but you, I need an answer right now. Are you, are you in? And I didn't know where the prep school was. I didn't know what it meant. Uh, but I knew this was a one, one time door open and, uh, and just said, yes, sir, I'll take it. So the Naval Academy prep school is one year in Newport, Rhode Island. And, and if you maintain good grades, you can, you basically get automatic admission to the Naval Academy. Each service Academy has a similar setup. And, uh, and, and, our, my life intersected with Captain Malillo for maybe five or six minutes. That's it. But he fundamentally changed the direction of my life. Yeah. It wasn't for him having some, seeing something in me and taking a chance and giving yeah. me this opportunity. I wouldn't be talking to you about space. I wouldn't be talking to you about life in the SEAL teams. I, would, I don't know what life would have been, but it would have been something different. And, uh, and I share that story because particularly now later in life where I have the ability to be Captain Molo for others and help them and, and guide them and give them advice. And, and when I'm able, give opportunities. And uh, it's just very, very special to me. And I'm so thankful to him uh, for giving me that opportunity. Yeah, no surprise you still remember his name even to this day. To this <laughs> and, uh... day to this day. And for sure, he didn't have to do that, right? I mean, I think that's the point. I mean, a lot of people could have just been like, yeah, it's just another kid. We'll figure it out. Right. Um, it could have been, a, you know, his wife would have been calling him and saying, hey, pick up the kids after school. Yeah. He could have forgot about me, but Man. he didn't. That's impressive. Um, did, for the prep school, do you end up then sequencing into the academy after that as a sophomore, or do you start over as a freshman? No, you start over as a, as a freshman. Uh, it was the best thing for me. You know, there's a big difference in maturity between an 18 year old and a 19 year old. And you also take the same courses that year. So, so not only did I have experience as military knowledge, it's just one year of it, but still more than your incoming freshman, yeah. um, but also had the, the, uh, a really solid academic prep. So it, it made my first year at Navy be really easy and allowed me to have good grades and, and just set me up for success. And, and then while you're at the Academy, Chris, I mean, clearly you go on to NASA later on in life. Was there a fork in the road for aviation as a particular path for you? Was it always SEALs? How did you arrive at uh, going to the teams? Yeah, when, when you're at a service academy, specifically Navy in this instance, um, you're exposed to all the different things that are, are choices for you, different communities that you can serve in. And, uh, you know, the big ones are aviation, surface ships, submarines, uh, you know, EOD, SEAL teams, other, there's a few, few others in it. And, and it, uh, 
and other supporting ones if you're if you maybe have a, not, a medical issue where you can't go into one of the other branches. But uh, I I did not know that this was in I went I graduated high school in 1988 before really the internet and uh, long before seals were so well known. So I had never even heard of a Navy SEAL until I showed up at the, the Naval Academy. And then I saw one of, of the mentors on, on the campus was a SEAL and he had the SEAL pin on and he was a pretty impressive person. And, uh, and, and just kind of learning about him and then learning about the community and the process, how do you become a SEAL? I just got more and more motivated. Like, do I have that in me? Can I do that? It, you know, is it an option? So that sort of started the spark for, for SEALs. I was also interested in the other, I mean, I thought everything I did. So in the summers between your years of school, you get exposed to different parts of the Navy. And I loved my time on aviation. I really loved the time on the submarine. I thought it was cool. I actually liked the time on the surface ship too. I didn't have an, an experience that wasn't fun. And so I thought, wow, this is, this is pretty neat. I did, as we got further and further into the, the program, I was very interested in SEALs and, and also interested in submarines. Uh, aviation, my eyes were like 20, uh, 20, 30 or something, it, right on the edge of being a pilot, like allowable. And I didn't, I didn't, I don't know, I'd heard stories of people get there and then you get, you, you, the doctor tells you you can't do it uh, for your eyesight or whatever. So I just wasn't, I, I, I I wasn't passionate enough about it to worry about my eyes that much. So it was kind of between submarines and seals. And, uh, and, it's, and, and there was, it was very competitive to get a seal billet. So I knew seals would be my first pick. And if I was not able to get one of the 16 positions of, uh, out of the class of a thousand, then I was going to go submarines. Wow. So what a different trajectory that could have been for you. Obviously. Yeah. Wow. I guess I like the water. Yeah. <laughs> Now it didn't have anything to do with the with Charlie Sheen's movie Navy Seals. Did that come out at that time? It was around. I forget exactly, but <laughs> no, didn't been in. Oh, yeah, no, just joking. Okay, um, so as you come out of the academy, as you go to the teams, what is the um, the experience of the teams at that time? Again, it was far more secretive, or maybe just less well known than it is today. Yeah. Um, were you there? It sounds like post um, post Gulf War. So were you arriving to teams that had been in some combat at the time? Yeah, the Gulf War. Um, yeah, I, I graduated Academy in 93. I think 91 was the big effort in the, in the Gulf War. So so uh, and then and then there was some combat in uh, in Panama, too. So those were the, the the recent activities when I was a brand new guy and hearing the stories of those seals and that those seal teams and those platoons and those individuals um were really fascinating to me and, and their lessons learned and i was just kind of awestruck but also as a as a young leader like wow what can i learn yeah. from, from these people and these experiences and, and soaked it all up a really crazy small world is one of the one of the, the combat swimmers who who put uh swam across the panama canal and put bombs on Noriega's yacht, uh, he later became my platoon chief at SEAL Team Three, and we worked together uh, later in our careers. So, That's cool. Yeah. Um, how how do how do the SEAL teams do when it comes to like passing down that oral history and experience? Because I like the military was all right when I was at the CIA. They do a fantastic job of it. Corporate America is not great. How was it in the teams? I felt pretty good. Uh, this, the teams are uh, coastal, so there's a, a, a group of seals in uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, Little Creek, and a group of seals in San Diego and Coronado. And it's easy because of geographic proximity to talk to, to hang out with, to to meet and and share experiences and knowledge with those in your on your coast. A little bit harder to do it uh, from coast to coast. At least when I was there, there wasn't there wasn't a defined program to help share that knowledge, unless of course it was your buddy, like maybe somebody you went to buds yeah. with, and and you were friends, you could pick up the phone and say, "Man, dude, tell me about that. I heard you just got back, and 
uh, you know, of course, if it's classified, you just do it next time you see each other, yeah. but that kind of thing. And um, at that point in time, how, uh, what was it like coming into the teams as a young leader or young officer? But it sounds like probably you're, you mentioned awestruck, intimidation, intimidating. How, how did the other folks take you in at that point in time? So I, my first SEAL team was, was an uh, underwater vehicle team, SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 2 in, in, in Little Creek. And nobody else, at, at that time, nobody wanted to go to SCVs. Uh, everybody wanted to go to one of the, the, the quote, normal SEAL teams. And SDVs, you do normal SEAL stuff, but also just focus uh, a tremendous amount on diving and driving these underwater vehicles. I love the water, and, uh, and I was excited to go there, so I volunteered. I was the only, only um, ensign, you know, brand-new officer in my BUDS class to go to the SDV team. And that was another just sort of blessing in life because other – Groups, other SEAL teams had three, four, five instant show up at the same time, and they're all looking to get in platoons or go to the great training uh, opportunities and uh, just sort of a built-in competition in a way for the for opportunity. Whereas at I was one of one, and, yeah. and every every new officer opportunity that was there, I was able to do. Uh, it, so I was really welcomed welcomed when I, when I showed up and, and, uh, had a fantastic chief, Mike Slinger was his name. And he just really showed me what it's like to, what good leaders do, what good enlisted leaders do, what good officer leaders do, how to work together as a small unit. How does your small unit work well with other units? Uh, and, and so just kind of quality mentorship. I could, my first commanding officer was fantastic as well, Doug Lau. So you know how it is. You, you just, you get some great examples. You get some that aren't, you know, but you learn from those two. Yeah. I was just really, really lucky in the beginning to have uh, fantastic mentorship and leadership all around me. And just briefly before we start talking about, as you move into um, the combat time, for your folks, did they have any concern with you going this route? I mean, it's obviously you didn't have the military family necessarily, but, you know, going to the academy, probably a great thing to see from your son, but how about going this path that's possibly more dangerous? Yeah. When I, when I was um, a senior at Navy, when I, I remember calling home one time and telling my parents I was going to pick SEAL teams, they were, they didn't know exactly what it was, but they knew it was combat much more combat oriented than driving a submarine and it, or at least in your face, right? Like yeah. submarines combat arms just as much as any, but you you have the, some separation. And, uh, and my, I think my mom's comment was, what, what are you going to do after you're done? Be a, be a security guard and uh, no disrespect to anybody in that profession. But I, I was like, no mom, I'll, I'll have something else to do. I don't know what it is, but I'll figure it out. Uh, and so I, I find I found that kind of comical. Now, wow. now people know about the seals a little more. And, and, and uh, in fact, I, I talk to a lot of parents of young hope, seal hopefuls and, and try to help them with the whole decision because it it, uh, it it can be nerve a nervous thing for a family when when one of their sons is going that route. For sure. And at this point in time, is NASA even a thing in your head? No, NASA was not a thing. I knew, of course, I, as an American citizen, I knew about NASA and I knew that they were astronauts, but that was for other people. You know, that's not something available to me or an option for me. Yeah. Heck, I'm not even going to be an aviator. I thought that you had to be, which you don't. You know, a lot of people think that, but we, as NASA astronauts come from all different backgrounds. Uh, aviation is just one of them. So if we fast forward to the first time you're kind of in, in combat, Chris, is, you know, as much as you can speak to it, and I'm assuming something happens before 9-11, but where, where are you at at that point in time? What's your role in the teams? And is this at SEAL Team 3? SEAL Team 3, which at the time, um, SEAL teams were organized in a way where 
each team had a different geographic area of responsibility in the world. And SEAL Team 3 was responsible for the Middle East Persian Gulf area. Uh, I was a platoon commander of SEAL Team 3 Echo Platoon. And we were gearing up for our normally scheduled six month deployment that was to happen right around Thanksgiving of 2001. So you're probably familiar and the listeners are as well, but just to recap, uh, a unit is together for about two years, at least in the Navy. And a year and a half of that you spend training as individuals, training as a small group, and then integrating your training with other units that you might be deployed with. Uh, and then you go overseas and you deploy for your six months and then return back and, and people change, leadership changes, individuals assume more responsibility and new guys get into the mix and then that unit starts that process all over again. So we were well into this year and a half workup phase uh, when 9-11 happened. On that particular morning, if you remember, it was like nine o'clock Eastern time. So I was in San Diego, Coronado, that, that was 6 a.m. there. I, w I had just gotten out of the shower, getting ready to go to work, and my wife came into the bathroom and said, "Hey, you gotta turn the, you gotta watch the TV," and uh, and I did, and realized, "Oh, I'm going to work today, and we're packing pallets. Wow. Uh, I don't know where we're going or when we're going, but pallets are getting packed, and that's exactly what happened. It took a couple weeks for the big logistics train to figure itself out, and." I, I can't remember exactly when we deployed, but it was towards the end of September when we left San Diego. Jeez. How, just out of curiosity as, as an officer, so you've been an officer for what, seven years at that time, seven, yeah, eight, seven years? eight years. Yeah. What's, um, and, and we hadn't really deployed that much, not at that scale, certainly like what was going through your mind in terms of, all right, how do I get people ready, mentally focused, is that even a concern when you're in the teams? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was a platoon commander, so my main focus is, hey, is our unit ready to go overseas and respond to whatever it is? And this is, you know, my, the mindset of, of the whole year and a half of prep. And, and you have that focus in the absence of, of, of any other defined combat. You still want to be ready. But when September 11th happened, it put this – right or wrong, it put this instant dose of reality into, into your mindset. Like it's not, we might be going into something dangerous. We are deploying to a combat zone, like directly. And it really ratchets your game up as, a, as an individual and as a unit, like, Hey, am I really ready? Is, is everything ready? Fortunately we had, I had a great chief in, uh, in this gentleman that I, I just mentioned who had done the, combat swimmer operations in Panama. And, and he had us ready. I had us ready. So we, we felt, uh, we felt administratively ready to deploy and operationally ready to, to deploy. Yeah. I had just interviewed Bob Pennington, who, um, who was in the ODA 595 that went in early on as well. So one of the Green Berets that went in and the famous horse soldiers. Um, I think that is where my mind gravitates towards less so what the seals were doing at that time. So what, what was, was there a certain division of labor within like, all right, the army's going to go do this, or was it really just, Hey, we have another special operations force on the ground. You've got this part of the battle space. In general, if you remember those, uh, and it, I'd be curious to listen to that podcast, but those, uh, forces that you mentioned, the green berets, they're coming from the North and moving. Yeah. South. Yep. Uh, and we were in the southern part of Afghanistan in Kandahar and uh, and doing operations from there, kind of moving to the north and trying to sandwich the country, if you will, uh, in, in that regard. The uh, the 06 Colonel Green Beret guy uh, was in charge kind of in that north northern section. We had a gentleman, a Navy captain, Bob Harwood later became Admiral Harwood. Uh, he was in charge of our, of our task force uh, in, this, in the, southern, the southern part. When we first got there, I remember that very first night, uh, the terminal, and, and we landed at Kandahar Airfield, the C-130, I don't even think it hardly stopped. It rolled, we, <laughs> we got our Humvees off and it was turning around 
and out of there before we were like more than 30 yards off the, the runway, it seemed like. Uh, and then, so we went right to the terminal building. If you've ever been to a tiny little airport somewhere that has like a one rectangular type yeah. terminal, that's what it was. An old, really beat up, just old style terminal. And, uh, and, and we took over that and that became the, the initial base of operations. Uh, and, and then each subsequent night, another couple of three, four C-130 loads with additional forces, Marines, Army, more Constantino wire, expanding the, the circle to add bathrooms and add a chow tent and you know, basic necessities. Uh, and then while that was happening, our platoon was, was doing initial operations to kind of each one to get a piece of the puzzle to piece it together and build an intelligence picture to kind of understand the battle space and, uh, and, and, and how do we fit into the bigger picture to find Bin Laden. Were you guys having to pull guard duty there or was it truly like they, there was enough support staff to, to build up what would become this massive footprint later? And, and you were just tasked with going out and doing the operational work. To Good get question. I, I I hardly recall those. In the, I think the first night, maybe we, we first couple nights we had to do guard duty, but then there was enough uh, support forces that were the, the, that you know perimeter security was established, and we could shift to focus totally on on operations outside the wire. Wow. And those first you know, the first days or weeks that you're there, do you end up at that point having an engagement or is it more about understanding the battle space and meeting with key players in the area? Yeah, there were a few little skirmishes, uh, but more the latter, more understanding yep. things and, uh, and our building up our own awareness too. Like how do you assess if that, 40 year old guy with the black turban on is giving you the sink eye or if he's wanting to borrow an MRE because his family's hungry. And maybe the answer is both. And, and it takes some, as, as you know, it takes some boots on the ground time to pick up on the nuances. How, you know, does it look like there's something under the robe? You know, all, all these things that you just can't get from a PowerPoint presentation on being ready. You have to be there and witness it and watch it. And so I would say building up a little bit of operational savviness um, in those, those early days. I do remember we spent Christmas Eve of 2001 down on this uh, place called the Sea of Dunes, south of Kandahar. Uh, so so by, by the end of December, you know, we, we were well entrenched in, in there and, and doing operations all around that, both by vehicle and by helicopter insertion all around that area. Do you, re do you recall, uh, some people do, some people don't, uh, the first time you're in one of these skirmishes or an engagement, just what it felt like for you leading troops into that for the first time? Yeah, the first time that I remember an engagement, it was it was across a ravine. We saw some guys and uh, observed them, and they had weapons, and they were clearly up to no good. And uh, and and we engaged them, and, and some bullets came back. And I I remember thinking to myself, "Hey, my job," and it was kind of like an aha moment. My actually, there's two aha moments. So I'll get into yeah. one more in a second. I, was, I remember thinking, my job is to make sure that, make sure we're making decisions an hour ago that doesn't get us into trouble now. Uh, in other words, be thinking a ridge line ahead, be thinking a maneuver or two away, be thinking of an air support call ahead of ahead of the, our, us. Um, and and so that's what I remember thinking in the first, you know, exchange of of rounds. I think. That one was largely ineffective fire. You know, you hear a bullet go in somewhere, but we were undercover. We had rocks all around us and, and felt pretty safe. And we could tell they just had small arms. Uh, Chris, then, what, just before you go to the second aha moment, on that one, 
were you thinking that like I needed to be prepared an hour ago for what's happening right now? Was it because of the position that you were in at the time? Like maybe it wasn't as advantageous as it could be and you felt like you were behind or was it just, Hey, we were in the right place because we were thinking ahead. No, it was, it was, I remember thinking, did I, cause I don't know the answer to that. I remember thinking to myself, did when we could have went, I think we, we went down one ravine and we had a choice to go one way or the other. And I remember thinking, Hey, if we went, had went right, would be, would we be even more advantageous terrain? The answer wasn't clear to me, but that's, that's when it dawned on me. Like I should be thinking that way. I should be thinking, Hey, wait, stop. Before we make this decision, left or right ravine, let's look at the terrain and let's, you, you know, I, I think I, I wasn't at my battle savviness wasn't to the point at that time where I was, I was, uh, really, truly, as a leader, thinking ahead, um, yeah. as much as I should, maybe a little bit ahead, but not, not all the way ahead. In aviation, since I, when I became an astronaut, we started. I started flying airplanes, and that's that's the man, mantra there. And is always be ahead of the airplane. Yep. You know, be thinking yeah. about where you're going to land if the engine cuts off right now, and uh, and it takes some operational experience to get there. We've definitely talked about that on this show, just with other pilots and and just describing what it's like in the air. Yeah, you really don't want to be behind the aircraft and you can just tell very quickly when you're falling behind and things are happening and you don't anticipate. And it's it's just scary when you're moving fast and people are relying on you. I remember one of the sayings I learned in, in SEAL training was the behinder you get, the behinder you get. Yeah. And that's not perfect English, but you know exactly what it means, right? Like you get on the backside of a curve you have to expend energy to get back to the top and then and then catch up. Uh, so true. And it's so, so true. Your situation awareness starts to drop off. Your your vision just starts to go in like that. And uh, and you just need to stay ahead as best you can. And I have a question just about team dynamics, but please, could we first go to the, the second aha moment that you mentioned before? Yeah, this is a good story I like to share in, in these days in, in my public speaking. But um, in preparation for a mission that we had on the Afghan-Pakistan border, there's a large cave complex called the Zawar Keeley Caves. Uh, our, our mission was to go to this cave area and, and flush it out. We knew that there was uh, enemy activity there. We knew that from intelligence that it probably had large stockpiles of munitions. It probably had safe haven type um, hangout support type thing for Taliban Al Qaeda. So we were to go there and, and, and flush it out. So we get given this, uh, this mission tasking. And you remember when you get a mission, you generally have a couple days to pull together your plan and, and the, the members of the team are coming in and out of the hut or the tent, in this case, the tent uh, with information. You got maps on the wall. You got flip charts with your plan. You got a sand table with your little GI Joe guys uh, um, to what to run through the, the rock drill or, or the, the, uh, the dry runs. And so that was going on for the two days leading up to the mission briefing when I had to brief uh, my boss, Captain Harwood, the guy. And uh, uh, so we felt like we had a pretty solid plan and he was known to be a real, real tough guy to get briefs to and ask probing questions and really make sure you have your what ifs uh, all thought through. So we felt like we felt like we were pretty well prepared, give the briefing and uh, it goes pretty smoothly. He had some questions and we had the answers at least, uh, you know, had thought through the, the question and, and more or less he was happy to say, okay, all right, go do the mission. Thought that was a home run, thought outstanding, fantastic. Look at my watch. There's like 37 minutes till I got to be on the helicopter. And oh, by the way, I realize I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I got to use the bathroom and I got to get my gear. And all of that, I have now 36 minutes till I got to be on the helicopter. So gather up the things from the tent and I'm the last guy out and I flip the light, the one remaining light off and, and I need to, I'm going to go to the bathroom first. Makes sense, right? And I'll take care of the food and the water and gear. And, uh, 
red lens flashlight's the only thing you use at that time. So coming out of the tent, little red lens flashlight illuminating my way to the to the toilet or the latrine and uh, just a, a hole, a trench dug in the ground, two four by four wooden posts with three tires over the wood. You know, most of the people listening to this podcast probably understand what I'm talking about with three sides of plywood giving you your privacy and one open face of the, of the bathroom facing out toward the runway. I turn around the corner and the flashlight illuminates boots and then naked legs. And then his face, Captain Hartwood's face right on the middle tire. Like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? And, oh. and I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I'll reshuffle the order. I'll go eat and go, go, you know, and get my gear and then come. And I'm like, no, that doesn't make any sense. I just got to do, Hey, sir, can I join you? Yeah. 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 Have a seat. Have a seat. So I sit down, drop a trowel. Our legs are kind of touching each other. It's super awkward. And I'm thinking like, why are you on the middle tire? At least go left or right, you know? And, uh, uh, super awkward. But right then and there, he, he turns to me and goes, Hey, you know what I expect of you? I expect you to make good decisions and bring the guys home safely. And I realized right in that moment, like the reason, the very essence of why I was getting a paycheck from the United States government that day was to make good decisions and to bring guys home and execute the commander's intent. And, uh, and that was a, a pretty significant moment in my professional growth. Uh, it didn't matter if I could run fast or shoot my gun well. I mean, those things are important, but fundamentally what's important is to have good situation awareness, use good head work, make solid decisions and be a leader. And uh, so I thank him very much for that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. So this is a perfect segue into what I was, I just wanted to ask about the teams when it comes to decision-making because it's such a small unit, how much do you weigh as a leader, the the input or how much do you seek input or dissent from the people in a SEAL team when you're doing an operation like that or when you're on an objective? Yeah. You know, I, at that stage in my leadership development, I didn't really give, it sounds bad, but I never gave a lot of deliberate thought to how much input do you get and when. It just kind of was a thing that naturally happened. And now looking back, uh, and, and other experiences at NASA have kind of re reinforced this. There's a time and place for democracy and voting and everybody buying in. And there's a time and place where the 75% solution with the information that one person has is the best answer. And you just got to act now. And then you sort out the implications of making a decision without that absence of the remaining 25% because you, you, you just need to do it. Uh, so I think in a perfect world, everybody in the unit can, can give their thoughts and have their input. Uh, but what makes it, but very often you can't, but what I think makes an effective unit and one that's well run and humming along on with oiled gears is when all of the people understand those nuances and, and, and know that, hey, my opinion would be heard. It just can't be right now. And, and, and I feel like I understand, and I understand the rationale for why. Yeah. And when, when people don't understand the rationale for a decision, I think that's what brews this kind of discontent that can crush a unit. Uh, and it really boils down to communication, I think. And in aviation, you say it, it's better to have fought through the plan at zero knots and zero altitude. And it's, it's the, same, the same thing, right, in, in, a, in a combat world where, hey, if everybody knows what we're going to generally do in this situation, not all situations are going to be exactly like you train. Uh, but then it won't be a surprise. And, and then afterwards, when the time is right or where you have a few minutes, you can you can uh, make sure everybody's okay. Hey, this is why we did what we did, et cetera. Is it, is it safe to assume that when you look at NASA, for those of us who are, have not worked there like many people, that the 75% uh, 
ratio is not quite enough for decisions that are made there that it's closer. Like it's okay for a 95%, but you got to be way closer to perfect. Or do you still have a lot of these decisions that are okay to be made in a timely manner that are 75% baked? Well, the nice, the nice thing about spaceflight is you don't have to launch until you're ready. You don't have to open the hatch to do a spacewalk until you're ready. There are some cases though that require, particularly with spacewalking, that you must go out today. Otherwise something is, you know, there's consequences to the vehicle safety or your personal safety. Uh, but to your point initially, to your question, uh, if something isn't right or, what, or, or the data is showing us something different than what we anticipated, you can, you can always call a halt to launch. It takes courage to do that. It takes courage for some young engineer to stand up in a meeting with you know, very senior people and say, hey, I understand there's a lot of pressure to launch today and we're going to have implications with our international partners or violate a contract with a commercial company. But I'm telling you what the data I'm seeing right here is unexpected, unexplainable, and my vote is we don't launch. Uh, that takes real courage. And it's not the same, you know, courage on the battlefield might be different, but courage by itself, no matter where it's showing you it itself, is something to be respected. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I can't, I'm just envisioning a launch of such a massive piece of equipment. It's not like calling off a flight or something for some smaller aircraft, a helicopter. Like to, to cancel that and all the time that's gone into it and push it. Yeah, that has to be so hard to, to speak up about. Yeah. So, Chris, if we, it, I don't know if there's a particular moment that you had when you were deployed that was maybe more difficult for you. Either the mission set was such that you thought, hey, my guys might get hurt on this one, or you didn't have the intel that you needed, or maybe you had a, a strong like leadership um, development moment. But does anything like that come to mind from your time in the teams before we transition to your time with NASA? Um, I, re the, I remember we had been deployed for a number of months and done a number of missions. And I could tell that our unit was really running well. Nobody, we almost didn't need to give a mission brief. At least it felt that way. And then I remember feeling, oh shit, that's kind of the complacency that gets people hurt. And I felt it. I, I felt that, that sort of overconfidence myself. Like we got this, we've been exposed to lots of things. You know, you can't plan for everything, but we're smart enough and well trained to, to deal with it. And I remember one night having a conversation with my chief, like, Oh, wow. You know, we hold on a second. We need to uh, make sure we're still doing the basics, make sure we're still briefing the same briefs, make sure we're, we're still, uh, I don't know. It sounds funny. It sounds, when I'm saying this right now, it, uh -huh. doesn't, it, it, it sounds like, well, why wouldn't you? You're, you, you're prima donna seals. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about when you get overly comfortable with something, that's when an incident can sneak up on you and grab you. And, uh, and I remember thinking about that and, and taking sort of a mini pause to make sure that all of our gear was maintained and we were, you know, good to go. We were definitely susceptible to that on the, the flying side where you always did a mission brief, like aviation is really well known for that. But when you just go out every day and you're on like a QRF and maybe you get a call, like, you know what to do, you know what the formation is, it's just a couple aircraft. And I think as a leader, it's really hard to say, hey, guys, we got to do this again. Like we, we have to do it, even though we know what's going on. Like here's the freaks, here's who's in the lead, here's who's trail. If we run into a problem, here's where we go. But it, it just takes a little more of that, like, um, I don't know, leadership equity to, it can upset some guys, but I think once you're done with it, everybody agrees, all right, good, we did it. Took us five more minutes than we needed, but at least we've, we've gone through this step and we're not as complacent as we might be. Yeah. Yeah. So as we were talking about before we started, you transitioned out of the teams into NASA in 04. Where does NASA start to, to come into play for you? Yeah, I went to graduate school from 
1998 to 2000. And it was, it was there in, in 98, yeah, 98, 99 that I, that I, I learned about the process of becoming an astronaut and, and how often they select and where's, how, where are the forms? How do you submit them? Um, who the office is that you need to call to, uh, to start the process. And I, I actually met uh, Bill Shepard, who was the first Navy SEAL to become an astronaut somewhere in that time frame. And, and, it, and I realized like, hey, if, if it, he was successful at getting selected, maybe I could be too. And he, I had the same schooling as him. And um, he was about 20 years my senior, my senior. And uh, I, I just thought, why not? You know, I love what I'm doing in the SEAL teams, but how cool would it be if I got selected to be an astronaut? I got really nothing to lose, but a little bit of hours in the paperwork. And, uh, and so that's kind of what drove me. And then, so I applied in 2000 uh, for the class of astronaut class of 2000. I was in graduate school, but I was not graduated. And the, uh, all of the Afghanistan stuff hadn't happened yet. So I was, uh, I did not get an interview. I did not get selected. Uh, and that was it. I had paperwork in NASA was going to do another class in 2002. Uh, but they, they canceled the, they realized that they didn't really need, they had enough astronauts in house. So the, they opened the process, and, but then, and I had my paperwork submitted, uh, but they closed the application and said, we're going to delay for two more years and have a, have a class in 2004. Well, in that time, I had graduated from grad school at MIT and I had the platoon combat experience in Afghanistan. So, Afghanistan. so I was a much more well-rounded and experienced and older applicant and, and NASA, uh, I guess they appreciated that and they, they selected me in 2004. You seem very nonchalant as you talk about it. When, when you didn't get selected in 2000, was it a big blow to you or was it really just like, hey, if this works out, it's gravy. If not, no big deal. It was not a big blow to me. I, I, I thought I knew that statistically it was a long shot. And, uh, you know, I thought, what you know, oh, well, didn't work. Yeah. Try again. And if it doesn't work, that's OK. I like what I'm doing. Was it hard for you to make the decision even after being accepted, which I, I assume not, but like you'd just gone through combat on the first stages of this war. Was it tough for you to come out of the teams, like to, to physically just break yourself away from that mentally, emotionally? I was sad to leave my friends and, and the close knit camaraderie, the community that the SEAL teams are much, no different than any other military community you know you get that from your unit you get that from wherever uh so I, I was sad to say goodbye to that i i knew that all of my my friends and colleagues would would continue to do amazing stuff overseas and they did um you know as an operator you're always envious when you hear stories about other units doing stuff and you're like oh my god it sounds so cool wish i was there uh, and I, I certainly had those experiences when I later, as the years went on, I would hear, hear from my peers about what they're doing. Uh, but to, quite truthfully, I was just, I was really proud that um, I was representing the SEAL teams at NASA. I was very excited to try something new uh, and, and learn something new, you know? It was just a, I, have lot, I have remember having lots of emotion. None of it was negative. Yeah. <clears throat> so haven't interviewed an astronaut before. So just talking through some of the basics of, you mentioned like people assume that you have to be an aviator. Obviously there are other roles. Could you just share kind of what role were you chosen for or, or do you find a track later on? And uh, what are some of the options there? So when we were flying the space shuttle, you have pilot that's, astronauts. That's awesome to hear. And the, and the mission and mission specialist astronauts. In order to be in the front seat of the space shuttle, you have to have been um, a fixed wing uh, test pilot. And uh, 
I say military trained, but you know, uh, Neil Armstrong, when he got selected, he, he was a civilian. So there are some civilians that have that background, but, uh, most of, most of the shuttle pilots were, were active duty military at the time when they were selected as an astronaut. And then mission specialists can be from really anything. In my class, we had um, three school teachers. We had a medical doctor, a couple research PhD type folks, engineers as well. And then of those people, there were military and non-military. I was a mil military non-pilot, uh, as we talked about. So the the backgrounds are, are, are various and fair and, and, and wide. Um, so initially I, I knew I, I was not gonna fly the space shuttle. So I fell in the mission specialist category. And in that category, really we're trained to do lots of different things. It breaks down essentially to spacewalking, robotic operations, and, and then scientific uh, operations on the, on the space shuttle. You were given a specific role for the missions were short. They were two weeks long. You knew exactly what the, your day-to-day -day stuff was on every day of those two weeks and what the daily mission was as well as the overall mission. So when I got assigned, well, I'll get ahead of myself. SEAL astronaut training is, astronaut candidate training is two years. So from the time you show up, you're two years of basically wow. learning how to be an astronaut. And uh, it's like graduate school and you spend time in a the classroom, then you spend time in the simulator. You do a little traveling to understand what NASA does around the country. Uh, because one of our collateral duties as an astronaut is to speak to the public in, about space flight. So we really need to know what NASA does in the broad sense besides our own little world of, of manned space flight. How, how large is the class that you're moving around with for these two years? Uh, our class had 11 Americans and three Japanese astronauts uh, were part of the class too. Japan has selected their own astronauts and then matched up the timing such that they, the three of them joined our class and we went through the whole two years together wow. as like a, a 14 person uh, element. And then do you go into space with that group or do oh. you you're separated? Yeah, once you complete the two years of astronaut candidate training, you're essentially in the pool of people who are waiting for missions to, to go to space. And, and they're not gonna fly a mission of all new guys. And so over the course of the coming missions, they sprinkle in the new, the new people with others who are experienced to build the experience base of the overall astronaut corps. And why is it that you ended up taking uh, fixed wing or aviation classes then if you weren't gonna be flying? So at NASA, we use the T-38 as, uh, we call it space flight readiness training, or in the aviation world, you're probably familiar with crew resource management, you know, dealing with each other, dealing with the dynamics of a cockpit, ah. talk, talking, uh, working procedures independently and, to, and as a team, dividing tasks in the cockpit so no one person is task saturated, all of those um, skills and abilities are fundamental to a successful space flight and you can't go to space to train for it. So we use lots of different analogs to get astronauts ready for space flight and, and uh, fixed wing aviation is one of them. So I, I have like 1100 hours in the backseat of a T-38. I, even with that many hours, I'm not authorized to, to fly the, you know, sign the aircraft out and fly it in the front seat. Um, but lots of hours working, working procedures, uh, sharing the duties of flying and navy, aviating, navigating, communicating, and all that stuff. But the, the front seater is the one who's the pilot in command and has to do the takeoffs and landings. But all of all of the rest, we just share the duties. So that's a fundamental part of astronaut preparation. Wow. And, and after those two years, how soon is it till you're on your first mission or space flight, I suppose? So the call that that said, hey, Chris, come work for us. Um, and I showed up in, the, in July of 2004, the summer of 2004. And exactly five years later, July of 2009, I was strapped to the top of the space shuttle Endeavor and blasting off the planet. Wow. And that's about average. A couple of my classmates flew, flew a mission or two before me, and a couple of my classmates flew a mission or two after me. But all of us generally flew in that five, six, seven year time frame from from showing up 
And uh, I've been, I was an astronaut for 17 and a half years and had three space flights. So if you do just basic math, three divided by, by 17, you're somewhere like five or six years between missions. So wow. yeah, that's about right. So could you just talk us through what it's like on that first flight for you? So I've, I often ask people what their first combat experience is like. I mean, what is it like um, being strapped in and even leading up to it, talking with your family about this? Space flight is combat. It's just the enemy doesn't wow. have a gun. The enemy is the environment. The enemy is machinery that's going to break and try to kill you. The enemy is a poorly written procedure that leads you down the wrong path. So as combat experience was so helpful for the right mindset of space, space flight. And uh, the, what it was like on the first mission, it's hard, you know, there's so many ways to answer that, but uh, going, everybody's probably seen pictures of, of astro astronauts, space shuttle astronauts with orange outfits and you're walking out of this building and waving to a crowd and getting on a bus that's astronaut crew quarters at, in, in Florida. And you ride that bus, it's about a 20 minute ride out to the, to the pad, launch pad. And, uh, and you're kind of joking around in the bus and uh, pretty jovial. But it dawns on you that there's a police escort. The police escort and your bus are the only things going towards the pad. Everything else is going away from the launch pad. And you arrive at, at, at there and, and it's this deserted place with normally it's a bustling activity. And you, you open the door and you look up at the, at the rocket and you can, you, it just smells different. It feels different. There's energy that you haven't sensed before. There's, it just feels very, uh, just high, intense. Intense is a good word. And you realize right then and there, like, wow, we're going to get on this elevator and ride up to the top of this thing and climb in. And that's what you do. Uh, you strap in. It turns out the fastest way to get out, once you strap in, the fastest way to get out of your suit is in space. Uh, our, our, our shuttle mission was uh, scrubbed five times. We launched on the sixth attempt. So it's a lot of, a lot of time where, you know, just from combat, for combat and veterans listening to this, yeah. man, you say, okay, we're going, we're going, get on the helicopter. Helicopter spins up and then settles back down and you do try come back tomorrow night to try to do the same mission over again. And you do that five times in a row. Eventually you don't believe that you're actually going. Uh, but we did, we blasted off and, and the ride to space under the powered, powered portion of the, the powered flight is about eight and a half, nine minutes long. And you're feeling three and a half times the force of gravity. So three G, the direction of those G's is into your chest. So it feels like a big gorilla pushing down on your chest. Your head is smushed against the, the, the headrest. Difficult to lift your arms up. Different than aviation G's where if, if you pull the stick back in a fixed wing jet, though the direction of the G forces is down your head. So the yeah. comes out of your head and that's what causes people to pass out. So we have sustained three and a half G's for the whole flight, uh, but you don't pass out because the it's not pulling the blood out of your head. Are you having to do the breathing, the same type of breathing exercises you might see in a jet? Not to the extreme that you do in a jet where you're like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just a little bit hard to breathe. I, to be honest with you on my, on my first mission, I don't remember thinking about it. Probably I was so amped up and excited to be there and just focused on my job and not wanting to screw up my job that I don't remember the breathing part, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, but my, my first task, I'm just rambling, dude. What, oh, no, no, this is great. Going, yeah, okay. please. My first task um, right after liftoff was to take pictures of the external fuel tank, which sounds like a pretty insignificant thing. But if you remember the space shuttle Columbia, it catastrophically um, ripped apart on reentry to the atmosphere because on launch, chunks of foam that orange fuel tank is basically foam on the exterior and the foam came off the tank at high velocity, had enough energy to poke through the thermal protection tiles on the wing. And they didn't know this until the end of the mission, or they didn't know this at all. And at the end of the mission, when they came back through the atmosphere, 
the, the high intense plasma bored a hole through that crack in the thermal tiles and ripped the wing off. And then they, they didn't make it. So the, the output of that is we knew that if you analyze the foam on the tank and it's all intact, then you have a reasonably good feeling that your, your shuttle is in good shape. If there's chunks of foam missing, then you, you need to do further inspection and do some analysis on where that foam was and where it might have hit. So that was my job. Take pictures of the tank. I rehearsed it in my head a hundred times. Okay, engines off, gloves off, helmet off, seatbelt off, camera, window, pictures. And I knew it. I had it down. I knew what I was doing. Yeah. So I did exactly that, not really paying attention to what was behind the tank, taking photos. And then the, the procedure calls to change the lens or something. Yeah, change the lens. Uh, so I pull the camera down. And now all of a sudden, I'm looking over the camera body at Europe. And we're, we're zipping by Europe five miles a second. And I knew we were 30 some minutes into the flight, which meant that 30 some minutes ago, we were stationary on the, in Florida. Oh. And I mean, most everybody listening to this has, has flown from the US to Europe and it's way longer than 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, so it gave me an appreciation of how fast we're going. Wow. And, and also like, oh my God, I'm really here. Like we are really in space and all this stuff that I've been training for, it's happening. Uh, so that was my first moment of, of realization. That is so cool. What was the discussion like? Maybe the, and maybe by the time you're there five years in, this is not a big deal anymore. But I think a lot of us as vets remember like, turning and walking away from our, our spouse and our family to go deploy. What's that like when you're leaving behind your family to go get on board this? Is it a similar feeling or are you it is a similar feeling. Um, the shuttle missions we knew were just in terms of time. So mm -hmm. let us set aside the, the risk aspect of yeah. it. But it, it's a two week a two two week trip. We're actually in quarantine for uh, a couple like ten days before launch. So the total time you're away is is ten days. But it's it's there's a lot going on and friends and family come to Florida and watch. So, so there's like a little mini family reunion that happens in Florida there. And so there's a lot of hubbub around it. Uh, but in terms of time, it's pretty short. Look, goodbye. You've done, everybody's done a two week business trip before. Uh, that's when the refrigerator breaks, of course. But uh, the, it was a little bit different on my sub two subsequent missions where I was leaving for six months. Those goodbyes are a little more. Yeah. And you add the intensity of, oh, by the way, in between you seeing me again, not only do I have to launch, but I have to return. And a lot of people don't realize it, but the return through the atmosphere is, in my mind, the more risky aspect of it. On launch, all the bad, scary stuff that can kill you is where? Behind you. On reentry, all the bad, scary <laughs> stuff that can kill you is right in front of you. Uh, so, you know, you got to survive the launch and the landing before you're going to hug and kiss again. So there's, there's, there's definitely some family dynamics with, with those goodbyes. And wh what's the feeling like when you get on your first spacewalk? Is that on your first mission that you get to do that, Chris? For me, for me, it was on, on my first, first mission. Uh, it's, it's a really, it's a lot of emotions go into it. Spacewalks are something that all astronauts and hope to do, endeavor to do, and train a lot, train intensely to do, but not everybody's lucky enough to do one. And so when you get one, you, you are very, you feel very fortunate and happy and, and you want to crush it. Just like, you know, any, anything that you're, you set out to do, you just want to do your best. Uh, but there's a whole lot of preparation that goes into it. It just, just putting on the suit, for instance, on that particular day, the space suit is pressurized to 4.3 pounds of pressure greater than the ambient pressure around it. So the valve is just a mechanical valve. It senses pressure and it puts 4.3 pounds above it. So when you put the suit on, on the side of the pool deck, you're, you're effectively a little bit, you're like diving a little bit in the pool. And you go, you submerge into the 40 foot pool that we train in, your body kind of feels like closer to 50 feet because you have a little bit more pressure around it. The converse to that is when you do a real spacewalk, 
the absence of pressure, zero, the spacesuit pressurizes to 4.3 pounds. So inside the suit, our bodies feel an, at altitude, which equates to roughly Mount Everest altitude. So you have to, we have to breathe pure oxygen inside the suit like a Mount Everest climber does to be, to be effective. And with that comes this long oxygen pre-breathe protocol. So simply to open the door is this long four hours before, oh. and then the six and a half, seven hours outside, and then another 40 minutes or so to come back in. So um, all in all, you're in the suit for the better part of 11 hours. It's a long, hard day, but so rewarding, so special. I remember very distinctly opening the hatch on my first one. It, it's, it was daylight out. By the way, you're going around the world every 90 minutes. So 45 of those minutes, <laughs> it's, it's sunlit, really bright. And 45 minutes, it's pitch dark. So I remember opening the hatch, it happened to be daylight, and I'm, I'm seeing Earth go by. And uh, it really got my attention. I remember one, one of my colleagues, Drew Foistel, he had emailed me right before launch day and said, on your spacewalk, loosen your grip. That was all his email said. And I was like, what is he talking about? But I knew right then at the hatch open, I knew what he meant. Because if you could have seen my knuckles, they were white. And I was, I would have ripped the handle right out of the metal skin of the space set, spacecraft. And that's what he meant. Like, loosen your grip. It's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Is there any family aside, any feeling like that that you experienced in the teams since like that moment of going out into space? Yeah. Um, I mentioned in this that going to space is going to combat with the, the enemy being the environment and mechanical things. So it was a very, very similar feeling to me as that razor sharp feeling that you have as a well-trained, ready to go, well-briefed, well-informed, well-supported uh, operator stepping out to do your mission, whether it's an aviator rolling over to drop the bombs or, or a helicopter pilot roll, you know, making that perfect landing in a combat zone or the ground guys stepping off the helicopter, going left, going right uh, onto a hot zone. It was that same exact feeling like bring it on. That's how, that's what I remember thinking, like, bring it. What do you got space? You can't hurt me. You know, I, this sounds cocky, but, I, I had that, like, I felt so ready and, 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 and just, it was exciting. I don't know how to describe yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. You must have rehearsed it so many times. I mean, you, you, yeah. good Lord. Um, you had mentioned as we were kicking off something about um, being tethered to someone else and the difficulty when that doesn't happen is, could you share that story? Yeah. So on my second mission, 2013, Oh, I'll start that right at the top. So on my second mission, 2013, uh, I had done I had done three spacewalks on my shuttle mission, my first mission. Now, uh, whatever, four four years later, I'm back in space, and uh, I'm with an Italian astronaut, Luca Parmitano. It was his first mission, and we were scheduled to do two spacewalks together. One, one week, and then seven days later, another one. And, uh, and so the, the time came, and, and we did the first spacewalk, and everything went by the plan, and, uh, and we did fine. The equipment responded fine. There was no real anomalies, and, uh, and we came back in at the end. We were uh, excited, and, and he, he completed his first one. And, and we're inside the airlock taking our equipment off, and when his helmet comes off, he's got a bunch of water on his head. And I'm like, where's that? What's that water, Luca? And it was his first, he said, hey, I don't know. I, it's been there. It was there, kind of got there at the last part of the, the last bit of the spacewalk. I wasn't sure if it was normal for repressurizing the airlock or I, I'm not really sure. And so I said, well, no, it's, it, it shouldn't be there. But we talked about it and we talked to the engineers in Mission Control and together collectively, we all decided, well, the spacesuit checks out fine. Nothing is nothing. No alarms are going off, and it, every check that we're running right now, the procedures, everything's fine. So we we thought, oh well, it, it probably is the a drink bag. We have like a Camelback that we wear on our chest, and his was empty, and he wasn't sure if he had drank at all. 
So we had decided like, oh, it must have leaked out and got up on his head. So we, collectively, we, we felt we talked ourselves into being OK. Yeah. A week later, we go to do this, the second of the two spacewalks. And the suit checks out fine. Everything's good. We open the hat. We do that whole four hour oxygen free breathe. We open the hatch. We're outside. We've been outside for like 45 minutes or so. And, uh, uh, and he gets an alarm on his, that goes off. And, it, and the alarm says CO2 high, carbon dioxide at above the level where the alarm trips is what it says. And, uh, and we wear procedures on our wrists. We flip, flip to the page and, and the procedure basically says, hey, is, is the reading off the scale high? You know, like, did it go from normal to completely pegged instantly? And if that's the case, then do you feel okay? And if the answer to those are both yes, then it's probably just a bad sensor that just instantly failed. And you can blow off the alarms you yourself are your own CO2 sensor and, and just pay attention to your symptoms and make sure you, if you're starting to feel weird, we'll, we'll deal with it, it with it then. But we knew that these, these CO2 sensors were somewhat susceptible to moisture. And uh, in the history of space flight, there, there was a, a long uh, list of, of times where the alarm sounded because of um, high humidity in the lines or whatever reason. So we weren't really that concerned about it. And we continued on. Not five minutes later, Luca says, hey, you remember that water that, we, that you saw last week? Well, I'm starting to get it again. And there's little balls of water floating around inside my helmet. And I'm like, oh, wow. And in my mind, as he's talking, I'm thinking, oh, uh, this is a bummer. The ground team is going to talk about it for five or 10 minutes. And then they're just going to tell us to be careful and continue on, Bill. But I, I was like, again, thinking operationally. Well, we're we're 20 minutes ahead of the timeline. They'll use up those 20 minutes, but it'll okay. We'll, we'll get back on the timeline and finish everything that we have to. So it'll be fine. Kind of like this. Oh shucks, what an inconvenience. Yeah, this is. And and I was a little bit separated from him. And then when I finished up what I was doing, a few minutes later, I got close enough where I could see this ball of water, which looked like a half of a softball or half of a grapefruit of water just sitting on his head. I could see it through his helmet. And, uh, and in that time he was right then he was able to get taste, grab one of the uh, beads of water in his mouth. And he said, Oh, wow, it's really, really cold and tastes foul, tastes nasty. Well, the sources of water that could it possibly be are sweat, urine, the drink bag, you know, the camelback of water that I talked about. Are any of those really cold? No. All of those are body temperature fluids. And the only thing that's cold is the technical water in the backpack that the system uses to cool, to cool you and cool itself. So right then I knew like, oh, wow, this is, it's not good. There shouldn't be that water, you know, there, how in the world is technical water getting into this helmet? So it kind of shifted from this, aw shucks, to, hey, we, this is a little bit more serious. And the, the ground team picked up on the same thing and they said, okay, guys, this is uh, probably not where we need to be. While things are, well, we've got a chance. Let's just end this spacewalk and, and, and Luca, you head on back to the airline. Well, we were probably 50, 60 yards, maybe 50 yards from, from the airlock. And, uh, and then we each have a safety tether, which is like a long dog leash. And in order to keep the dog leashes from tangling up and wrapping around each other, we, we take different paths to get to a place. So when Luca had to go back, he had to go one direction around some parts of the station and I was to go the other. Uh, and, they, and they said, oh, Chris, since everything's stable, why don't you just tidy up the work site, clean up your, your, your tools, and then Luca, you head back and Chris, you meet, meet him there in a few minutes. Okay, okay. And right then I see Luca disappearing. And you remember, like in the military, we've heard this saying before that problems happen at the fold of a map at the intersection of four grid squares and at night. And this was stacking up to be this case. 
right as he starts to leave, the sun sets. Like instantly it goes from well lit to completely pitch dark. And as he's moving, I didn't know this at the time, but the water that was very stable right there in his head, it starts as he moves, the water then moves and it whooshed around his face and his eyes and his ears and his nose. And on his microphone, booms, the water got on there. And, uh, and so he's effectively flying blind at night on the backside of the space station, trying to get back to the airlock. And I'm finishing up what I'm doing. And also, and, and, but as I see him turn the corner, I have this feeling in my, in my stomach, like, Oh my God, I need, this is the very definition of swim buddy, you know, back to swim pair one. Like I need to be with him right now. Like this is, this is wrong. Like stop. And, and I, all this was going through my head in an instant, but I knew that my tether that was strung out, if, if we were going to go together, one of us had to go on the other person's safety tether and leave one tether completely strung out, which was running across what would be rotating equipment that they had turned off for us to do the spacewalk. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be great for the space station to have a tether strung out. And I knew that we probably wouldn't be coming out here anytime soon because of the nature of the, of the problem. So all that going through my head and I thought, okay, just let it go. Don't say anything, hurry up and get your stuff done and, and go back. And if he's not at the airlock, I can trace his tether up the other side and find him. So I didn't say anything. A few minutes go by and I'm now halfway back to the airlock. I hear him faintly. His communication is very intermittent. You, knowing now, you know that the water globs kind of go over the mic boom and then not, and then over the mic boom and then not. And, uh, and he, he gets to the airlock and like, okay, Luca, go in, just go in. The normal sequence is a much more choreographed uh, script. And, and I see his feet kind of go in and I remember thinking to myself, how, what do my hands need to do in order to not make this situation worse? Because everybody knows who's an operator that things never get super good really fast, but they sure can get, go to hell in a handbasket really, so really fast. So effectively all I could do is break even. Like I couldn't make this thing better, but I can make it worse. And I remember thinking, what do I, my hands need to do? And I don't really remember what my hands did. And that's where I find it so fascinating about training, the importance of training. Because I, in the pool and from previous spacewalks, so many times I had entered in and, and out of the airlock and, and bags and tethers and valves. And it just happened. And, and you know, any, everybody listening has probably a similar story, like even as simple as turning to go, you know, turning your car to go into your driveway. You've done it a hundred times. You don't even think about turning and how to line up to your garage and everything like that. Uh, so it just happened. We got in, we got the hatch closed. And, and uh, uh, But the, the essence of my story is the only thing I would change is I would have spoken up at the time. I wish I would have and said, stop, everybody stop. Luca, don't go anywhere. Hey, Houston, I'm going to leave my tether out here and I'm going to hook up to Luca and we're going to go back together because that's the right thing to do. It all worked out fine. You know, we made it. His helmet came off. We probably had like 20 minutes to spare before he would have been in a situation where he couldn't couldn't breathe, uh, which is scary. But it made it. We made it. Uh, wow. Very, very crazy day on a spacewalk. Did, did, um, did it feel nerve wracking when you came back in? I remember it feeling nerve wracking once I got the hatch closed and, and had a moment to reflect. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, wow, this is madness. And then I, I was able to maneuver in the airlock and look into his helmet and see that the water had grown even more. And it, it was all the reason why he wasn't answering our calls is because he couldn't hear us. He couldn't talk. He could barely, he couldn't really see. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, so this, this brings up one of the questions I wanted to ask. Um, when you go through experiences like that and you've gone through training for two years with these people, you've prepped for the mission for several years, you're out there for two weeks to six months. When you compare the camaraderie or relationship that you have with people that you've gone to space with compared to people you've gone to combat with, is it pretty similar? Similar. Yeah. yeah very similar. And I, and I think it's not, be, there's nothing unique. Well, both of those 
situations are, are, are different, but they're the same in that it's a small group of people trying to accomplish a risky mission together and do it safely. Yeah. Yeah. That's the bottom line. So true. God. Um, is there something, uh, and I'll get you out of here soon, Chris, but is there something about NASA or space flight or this experience you've had that people don't really understand unless you've lived it? Like maybe the pain that goes along with having to wait, um, some of the discomfort you experience that people don't talk about much. Is there anything that comes to mind as something that most wouldn't know unless they were in it? Nothing really that, I mean, we all feel really privileged to get to do it, you know, particularly that, you know, we're representing the government taxpayers are, are allowing us to do it. And uh, so, but there's some hard, there's some hard things like if on a six month mission to the space station, you're living at work and you're there every day and you're doing things that um, require a lot of focus and you, you can get long-term fatigue. And I, I think maybe that would have been less relatable prior to COVID, but I think people can relate to that now where yeah. you spent six months at home and you're just like in your house all the time. And uh, you're just not as sharp and you're longing to, to have, you know, to go running or whatever you want to do. Uh, so that long-term chronic fatigue is something that we pay particular attention to and police each other on and, and just make sure that on, on, on Sundays it's a completely free day and you can recharge your batteries, call home, have video conference with your family, uh, that sort that sort of thing. So I would I would I think that to answer your question, COVID it, it makes it relatable. You're you're just a six months kind of like living in COVID. And but on top of that, you're 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 working on experiments, you're working on the maintaining the space station and you're reading procedures all the time. Uh, so we, we just really try to pay a lot of attention to mitigating mistakes that can happen when you have that kind of chronic fatigue. Yeah. And after your 17 years there, Chris, what, um, how did you figure out what you were going to do next? As we start talking about the, the national medal of honor museum foundation, like you could have done many things I would assume. And how did you, because a lot of people in the military have this trouble, like transitioning out of this high intensity, very meaningful experience. And you've lived two of them in one life. Um, how were you thinking about what came next for you and your family? Well, it was, it was, you know, I, just like everybody transitioning out of military, I, I had a lot of nights where my head was on the pillow thinking, what is it? What do I want to do? What, what lights my fire? You know, like, do I want to continue working with, with government organizations? Do I want to try something different? Do I want to be private sector business? Do I want to be in a big business or a small one? Where in the country do I want to live? Is salary important to me? You know, all of those same questions that everybody has, uh, I was going through myself. And uh, in turn, I loved being an astronaut. I, I really loved working at NASA, uh, but I was, I was, I was 51 in 2001, while I was in space, I was 50, 2000. And in that time frame, I knew that if I flew again, it would be another six or seven years down the road. So 56, 57 years old to do another mission. And if, if I was looking to get a job after another mission, it's probably a little harder to get a job as a late 50s year old person than a young 50 year old person. Um, so that was a key part of it. And I had three great missions and one more mission, I don't think would have made me more marketable to any, any employer. Uh, so all of that was kind of going through my head, but I didn't really know what it was I wanted to do. Uh, when, when my, when my case called me and said, Hey, uh, I'm on the board of the metal water museum. Would you be interested in, uh, in coming to work for us in a leadership position? And, and, I wasn't sure. I had kind of this direction that I thought we were, I was going as an individual and as a family, we were, uh, had a places in the country where we wanted to live. Um, so it was, was something different and something that I hadn't thought about because I didn't know about it. So it took a little bit of, even though I was, I thought the mission was amazing and I was passionate about the project. It was right away. The first phone call, I was kind of a little bit hesitant to be like, oh, I might, I'm going to try to fly in space as a commercial astronaut. 
I'm not so sure. I, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not so sure that I can do both, that I could keep that going and, 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 and take on a, a museum role. Uh, but kind of thinking it through, it just felt like a, a wonderful opportunity, working with great people, an organization that, that really means something. And, uh, and if there's a, a potential future space flight, that might, that might be uh, still available uh, three, two, three, four years down the road if that's how, you know, if, it, if, I, if I choose to move on from this job. So I got comfortable with it and uh, over the course of a couple of one or two phone calls with Mike and, and then there was some administrative process. They had a, a hiring firm that I had to interview with and, and do my resume and all that stuff. Uh, and then they offered me the job. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so could you share a little bit more? We talked to Daryl, obviously, but just a little bit more about what the, the foundation does timelines that you're looking at yeah absolutely so it's the medal of honor museum foundation which is really three projects that fall under it one is a physical museum here in arlington uh, and then a, a monument on the mall in washington dc and the third aspect which in some ways is most exciting is a leadership institute the institute will be housed in the museum here in Texas, but, uh, and, and that's becoming more and more of a real entity now. It was, it, you know, I would say when I first came on the job, it was just kind of one PowerPoint page deep with no real uh, thought to what it meant because we had to put a lot of effort into raising money to build a building. Now we feel the building's under construction. We still have a little bit more fundraising to do, uh, but, but now we, we have the ability and bandwidth to, to, uh, to bring to life the Leadership Institute. It'll have a, a, a adult corporate kind of piece to it, a youth character development type piece and a uh, collaboration thought, you know, sort of uh, partnership with other institutes, you know, kind of a third pillar. Because the, the Medal of Honor, as you know, uh, Ryan, it's, it's joint, you know, it's not one service. And their service academies, West Point, Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, they all have leadership uh, institutes or leadership centers. So we feel like the Medal of Honor Leadership Institute is in a great spot to kind of be a hub for other institutes or, and bring together in a, in a thought sharing way what character, about characters, true leaders of character and, and value and you know, values, what it means. Yeah. So we've, we've got, uh, our, we're having our first uh, Leadership Institute program in, in November. And so we realized we can get that going before we actually have the building built. So anyways, that's, that's the project. In terms of construction timeline, we, we broke ground on Medal of Honor Day, which was March 25th, actually two months ago today. And uh, it's a, a two and a half year build. So we're anticipating Veterans Day, November, of 2024, uh, opening the doors. Wow. Yeah. How, um, I mean, these are iconic buildings that will live for forever, basically. And as we think about these different monuments on the mall and, and these museums dedicated to certain organizations, how much like from all the pressure that you felt being a, in the teams leading there and being out in space, like how does this stack up uh, having this type of responsibility? You know, I've never, you, you get nervous when you step into uncertain situations, right? And, and sounds crazy, but I felt well-trained and ready to go and deploy overseas. I felt ready, well-trained and ready to do a space mission. I've never built a museum before. I've never led an effort to raise money to, to at this scale. Uh, but it goes back to the fundamentals that, that we talked about, about like what we learn in boot camp and hell week is you don't do it alone. And, uh, and we've got a great team of people helping on the construction side. Now we have, we're forming a team to build out and, and, and the leadership Institute, uh, same with fundraising. And, and so, I'm, I'm a little bit less intimidated by the job now. I'm in nine, nine months into it, 
Uh, and sometimes I still wake up and go, wow, I, am I over my head here? But <laughs> I think that's a healthy feeling, right? Because that, yeah. that, that means you're pushing yourself and, and you're there. We've all been on the, a run where you're just kind of going along by yourself and then your buddy comes up next to you. Next thing you know, your pace has increased. And yeah. you, both, you both can't talk anymore and, uh, and you're just dragging your butts to the finish line. I will say when I was chatting with Mike the other day, prepping for this, he was saying, you know, I've been around senior executives and boardrooms at huge companies and, you know, the White House, and National Security Council, all that's interesting. Those people are great. But just sitting on a bus with these Medal of Honor recipients is just so special, like being around the people that you are because you're on the board there, or you're in a leadership position. So it just sounds like such an amazing opportunity. I wish you all the best there. Is there any Anything you'd ask of people listening? Is there a way they can donate or help out um, with what you're doing? Yeah, our website, mohmuseum.org. You can go visit there and learn about the project, learn about recipients. That's what we're really here to, is inspire people with these stories of courage and sacrifice patriotism. Uh, there is a donate button if you choose to. Every dollar helps, you know, if you want to give, you want to skip, skip your Starbucks visit tomorrow and give us the $6.95, uh, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, so Chris, usually I end this with two questions for people, which I have for you, but there's one extra one I'd just like to ask. Um, as people who are listening to this, who don't know you more than just what they're hearing right now, and they hear that you've been Naval Academy, you know, high school quarterback, Naval Academy, SEAL teams, astronaut, leading this huge effort um, with the Medal of Honor Foundation, they might get the impression that you've never failed anything in your life. So I just wonder if you have experiences that you would share with people where you also had setbacks despite all of the success, um, just to help them frame some of their own experiences. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, human, just like everybody else. In fact, in high school, although I was a quarterback, we were very, very terrible. Uh, <laughs> my junior year, uh, we were 0-9, and, and I threw probably, not probably, far more interceptions than, than touchdowns. And uh, my senior year, we won two games, but we were still two and seven. And uh, I was a little better, but still lousy. I felt I felt uh, a lot of personal uh, shouldering, a lot of the blame for those two two seasons. I felt like a, uh, sort of letting my teammates down. Felt like a failure, kind of, in a way. Um, and then, you know, not getting not getting into the the Naval Academy, although. The story I shared with Captain Malillo really kind of bailing me out uh, in that regard. Uh, and, and then later, later in life, um, not, not getting into the first time I applied as an astronaut, although I, I shared with you, I, I, that didn't take that too significantly because I, I kind of mentally was thinking I wouldn't get picked. And I, I was more in a mental place of if it happens, that'd be, that'd be great. Uh, but I stress about failure all the time. And, um, you know, I'm not too proud to ask for help when it's needed. I think that's one thing that helps a lot. Fair. And then um, the, the two questions I have just to get us out here. One is um, when you were either on the teams or out in space, you know, I'm not sure if you have a different answer for this, but was there anything that you took with you like into combat or into space that had sentimental value good luck charm, something that somebody gave you that you just wanted to have on you? That's so funny you should ask. I had this little astronaut figurine that uh, was in a toy for, that my son got at some, uh, we gave my son at Christmas or something and, and there was a, one or two of them and I took one and, uh, and that little guy, little plastic astronaut was in my pocket on every single mission uh, in Afghanistan and then because I felt like the good luck that it brought to my, not only me, but to every member of my unit, because none of us, all of us came back with our fingers and toes and, and alive, uh, that that astronaut little guy was, was with me on all three space missions. He's a little worn out now. It's, his face is rubbed off and one arm is broken. Uh, but it's a good luck charm that I have uh, brought with me on, on every, every mission. That's really cool. And then uh, the last question I ask everybody, just having gone through what you did early on in you know, post 9-11 and all the time you spent preparing and going to space, 
as you look back at the hardships and sacrifice, would you go back and do that again, despite all that? Oh yeah, I would. No, no question. I, I just felt what I, I, the most proud feeling I have about the career, the Naval career I had is, uh, it's really feeling like I was representing my, the United States of America and, and doing my part to make our country better, whether it was a military or wearing American flag on my NASA outfit. Uh, it just always made me proud to look down and see that American flag there. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the time, Chris. This is great. We've never had an astronaut on certainly, um, a first for us. And thanks for going in in depth on a lot of this. It's really interesting to hear what it's actually like there, not just on the teams, but out in space and, and the community you develop as a result. So thanks very much. We'll make sure people can get uh, to the to the website and and help out in whatever way. And I'm really excited to to learn more about what's going on with with these uh, recipients. Uh, the Leadership Institute sounds incredible. I had not heard of that before. So thank you for sharing all this with us. Thank you, Ryan. My pleasure. Wonderful to be with you today. Our first comment is a YouTube comment from Cooney B on the Ferrat interview. Uh, the part two interview, actually. He says, um, really appreciate the time and thought you put into your guests. The questions, etc. It really shows and makes your podcast stand out as one of the best. This was a fascinating interview, and most people do not give the Kurds the credit they deserve. He lived a truly inspiring life and his sacrifice does not go unnoticed. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I never got to fight with the Kurds. I know we did so much with them. And I, there's a part of me that wishes that I was there uh, when they were fighting ISIS. And I know their fight's not actually done. Um, they have a lot that they have to defend. Um, the other thing I would just say, thanks for the call out of the questions, the guests, and how we run this podcast. We learned recently um, that we're in the top 1% of all podcasts globally. So it's a huge accomplishment. Couldn't have done it without uh, people like you who listen and contribute to our community. So thank you for that and supporting us. Our second comment comes from Neil McKinley, and it's on the James Rizone interview on YouTube. It says, I want to thank you for having such a great group of individuals on your show and creating such a great platform for these individuals to speak about their experiences. I've done some good work myself, and it's helpful to see that most of us, regardless of service application, have dealt with the same thing. Keep up the great work, sir. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned this before, but I think that's what a lot of people really enjoy about this is even these serious door kickers. Um, deal with a lot of the same problems the rest of us have. And it's helpful in uh, grounding the rest of us and making us realize we're not alone in this. So thanks for calling it out. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. And then just briefly, for, uh, for those who are supporting the Combat Story Patreon community, we've uploaded all the photos that Chris sent over, and there were many which is great. Sometimes we don't get a lot, just people don't have many from their time in service, but Chris sent a ton over uh, from both his time with the SEALs to his time in space. Um, we didn't have room to include all of these in the interview, but we thought our Patreon faithful would appreciate these. So you can head over to www.patreon.com slash combat story to see all of these photos of Chris. They're really cool. Thanks everyone. Stay safe.